I know some of you, I don't know all of you. I am Eric Dumba, I'm an associate professor in urban planning, so you may know me. Uh, and I'm the associate director of the Collaborative Science Center for Road Safety, uh, which is a DOT funded research center in partnership with Chapel Hill and Duke and Berkeley and University of Tennessee. That's interested in coming up with new ways um, to reduce traffic related death and injury. Um, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with, with traffic safety, but we lose about 40,000 people a year in the United States to traffic crashes. Right, that's a little more than 100 a day. Your chance of being killed in a traffic crash is about 1 in 120 during your lifetime. The odds are pretty good that you will know somebody who gets killed in a traffic crash. The odds are pretty fair for this number of people that one of you will die. So there's a reason to care. Sunny stuff, right? <laughs> so to address this issue, the, epi the epidemic of crashes on the roadways, we run a lecture, which you guys are here for every semester, uh, that addresses issues of traffic safety. And today we're fortunate to have Dr. Michael Meyer, uh, who is an internationally acclaimed consultant in transportation planning, former professor at Georgia Tech, and the author of the definitive textbook on urban transportation. He's done an awful lot of work of, on safety, he was also my dissertation advisor. That, that's the key right there. Right? <laughs> Got me into safety, because I started out into planning and design and engineering, concerned about building livable spaces, livable streets, places where people want to interact with one another, places that Peter Hen can make money off of. <laughs> I thought that'd get your attention. Right? Um, but I realized that one of the major things preventing us from doing that was that we're creating systems that are unsafe. Um, and safety devalues property, it devalues community, and we need to find a way to bring safety back into the planning and design process. And Dr. Meyer here is an expert on that. He is the guy to go to on this topic, so he's going to present planning and safety for you guys, so you'll have a sense of how this relates to your professional careers, to the communities you live in, your lifetime, and for those of you who, who wind up being professional planners, how to integrate that into your practice. So with that, I'll introduce you to Dr. Mark. Thank you, Eric. Uh, overwhelming applause, thank you. Um, good FAU, uh, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk today about the integration of safety and transportation planning. I am assuming that most of you are not that familiar with transportation planning, so I'm going to start off with kind of a brief overview of what we mean by transportation planning and then talking about where safety can fit into that overall framework. Uh, now, I'm a friendly kind of guy, and I like to walk around. Unfortunately, for the video person here, I'm going to go back and forth. He's going to have to follow me. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments, don't raise your hand. Just, just say, gee, what you, why are you doing that? I'd rather keep this as informal uh, as possible. Um, and uh, we can get into any discussion you'd like to on this topic, or for that matter, anything else to do with transportation. I've lived a long time in the area of transportation and continue to focus on many transportation issues. Um, so let me talk about transportation planning first before I talk about safety. Uh, and the question is, what are the key steps that we as transportation planners go through uh, when we do transportation planning, ultimately leading to a transportation plan or a series of recommendations on what you do with things like the transportation system or land use or enforcement or public policy, whatever the case is. Um, we always start first by organizing ourselves. We have to be able to focus on how are we going to address a particular problem. Now, I think some of you probably know that every urbanized area in the country over 50,000 population by federal law must have an agency called the Metropolitan Planning Organization, otherwise known as the MPO. Um, so if you go to Butte, Montana, or you go to uh, Seattle, Washington, or you go from my hometown, Madison, Wisconsin, and you want to know what they're doing in transportation in that city, uh, you can go to the MPO, whatever it may be, uh, and ask to see the transportation plan, and they will have it. They are the ones responsible for that. So, so that's kind of the organizational structure at a fairly high level for doing transportation planning. As what you'll see as I go through my talk is when you start focusing on safety issues, you then start to ask yourself the question, who should be part of the planning process if you want to bring safety into that particular perspective? Second, you need to understand what the problem is. Um, for example, I was director of transportation planning for Massachusetts for five years, way back, a long time ago before you were even born. Um, and one of the issues at the time in Massachusetts was congestion, which by the way, 
coming up from Fort Lauderdale Airport today. You guys should know about congestion. I, I live in Atlanta now, and we're always known to have a lot of congestion and sprawl. Well, you guys are a lot worse than we are, as far as I'm concerned. So, so you know about congestion. So why was the state DOT official? I'd be called all, all the time out into the suburbs of Boston saying, what are you, the DOT, going to do about our congestion problems? And I'd say, we don't have a congestion problem. And they look at me and say, yes, we have a congestion problem. Look at all these roads. They have cars. I said, no, we have a land use problem. And the problem we have is you, local officials, are approving all these developments, everything occurring, which are generating trips, and then congesting our roads. And then you come to me and expect me to widen the roads and handle the problem that you created. So my understanding of the problem is your land use issue, not, not my problem. Uh, now, the governor at the time told me to say that because he didn't want to spend a lot of money widening roads. Uh, but basically, how you understand the problem. What is it about this particular issue of safety, for example, that you really need to get a handle on to be able to say something intelligent at the other end of the process when you're actually coming up with recommendations to improve safety in, in, in the context of the transportation system. Now, in our planning process, I'm sure most of you in other fields as well, uh, you want to start off with a vision. What is it you want to be in the future for planning? In this case, what is it you want your transportation system to be, or what is it you want your community to be, and where does transportation fit into that? So we go through a whole process of visioning. We go through a process of defining what is it, what are the elements of that vision that become important. I've just taken three, economic development, environmental quality, and mobility and accessibility, which are the transportation elements that are fairly common if you at all understand the concept of sustainability. Those are kind of the three dimensions that people talk about in terms of trying to get a more sustainable society. Uh, so we have this vision, um, but then that leads to something a little bit more definitive in terms of what are we trying to achieve in the context of that vision with the transportation system, goals and objectives, and I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. And then how do we monitor whether we're achieving those goals through what are called performance measures? And I'll show you some examples of those in a minute as well. That then leads, in terms of the planning process, to a pretty definitive kind of technical analysis. If you talk to a lot of professionals these days and say, well, what do we do in transportation? Oh, we do modeling. We do data analysis. We do X, Y, and Z. That's the guts right here. This is the technical analysis component of planning. But planning's more than just that. It's much more than that, which I'm trying to show you for this entire framework. But this is the guts of the analysis. You have to figure out where the data is coming from, what are the types of models and tools and analysis methods you're going to be using, um, you know, what are some other, where are you getting your ideas for projects or strategies or actions. That's all part of the technical guts of doing transportation planning. Now, if you had a lot of money, uh, you would just do everything. Okay, I go through my process, I identify 250 projects I want to do. I, I've got plenty of money for 250 projects, I'll do it. The problem is we never have enough money to do everything that we uh, think we should do. So we have to somehow evaluate which ones are more important than others, and that's called the evaluation process. Now it's important to understand and point out in this figure that what you'll see at the bottom of this is it's not just developing a list of projects, which are here, uh, you don't have infrastructure projects or operational strategies, but all good planners, and here's words of wisdom, all good planners recommend you do further studies. You have to do further planning. Um, in fact, this planning process by federal law recycles every four or five years, so it's a never-ending job for planners, at least in transportation, uh, because it's a cyclical process. So the results of planning can be projects, operational strategies, additional studies. It could be, let's change the enforcement regulations to have a better handle on what's going on in the system. Education and awareness, trying to get people more aware of what important things are going on out there, like safety. How do we better enforce our system? Uh, where are we going to get the money for this? So we talk about financial strategies, public or private, or public-private combined. How are we going to develop partnerships among all the different agencies involved? And how do we develop a collaborative undertaking to get these things all done? Now, in the United States, and many other countries, uh, there are actually laws which say, and in the United States there is a law that says all of this must develop a plan, a transportation plan. Um, so, for example, South Florida, uh, there are several MPOs in South Florida, they have transportation plans. Atlanta, where I am now living now, has a transportation plan. As I said, Butte, Seattle, Madison, Wisconsin, all have transportation plans, and they develop, that all comes from this process here, comes up with a transportation plan, and that then goes into a program. Here's what we're actually going to build because we have money for it, which then leads to actually we're going to implement strategies and all good planning processes, going back to the cyclical nature, recycle back, and you start all over again. Okay, And that's through what's called system operations or you're monitoring the transportation system.
Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is go through this again, but in each step, if you will, I'm going to say, well, here's how you can consider safety as part of this process. So you get a, get a sense of how that could happen. Now, understand that this planning process is also for congestion, it's also for economic development, it's also for air quality, it's also for everything. And so what we're talking about today is how do you fit safety in this planning process so that, in fact, it gets the attention it deserves while at the same time understanding that local elected officials are jobs, 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 economy, 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 that's what they want to do, or too many traffic, too much congestion, whatever the case, we've got, to, we've got to solve that problem, and then you throw safety into the mix of all this, and then you're going, well, how do we make those trade-offs? Okay, well, how, how do we come up with a plan and a program that includes all of the above in a way that's fiscally responsible. That's really what we're all about. So this is the process that does everything, and what I'm going to be talking about is where, in fact, do you put safety into that process. Now, that framework is not that dis different from what other planning processes. In fact, I did that framework many, many years ago in my first book. Um, I came up with that concept of how we can look at transportation planning. Uh, and it turns out it's very simple and uh, very similar to others. This happens to be from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, this is the Transportation Safety Management Plan for, for its focus exclusively on safety in Cheyenne. And what, they, what do they do? Well, we establish a committee. Uh, we look at our data. Uh, we identify where there are areas that we have to work at, worry about, so-called emphasis areas. What are our goals? What are we going to do? What are our performance measures? How are we going to implement? Sounds very similar and familiar to what I just talked about in terms of my framework. And I was there before they were. Um, so, so this idea of going from ideas, what do we want to be, all the way through a process to kind of coming up with recommendation, recommended actions is fairly common. So it's very similar to other places. Okay, so where do we put safety into this transportation planning process so in fact that safety is considered seriously? Well, let's start at the beginning, okay? So how do we organize ourselves within the, within the context of safety now, all right? Um, so the question is, you know, where do we, how do we get safety participants and constituencies involved in the process? Well, here's an example from, again, Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm using Cheyenne. I'm using a couple cities uh, because they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that Cheyenne is any better than Boca Raton, although they are, uh, in safety. Uh, not in weather, that's for sure, but certainly in safety. Uh, and places like Southeast Michigan, which is Detroit. Um, Houston, very big in terms of major metropolitan areas, have been doing, it's been doing a lot of work. So you'll see examples from these metropolitan areas from around. But here is an example of, quote, how they organize themselves in Cheyenne in the area of safety. I am not going to go through all this list because there is another slide with a continuation of the list. Uh, now, I, I'll, I, I, let me assure you that the Laramie County Sheriff's Department is not a normal participant in transportation planning. Because what, what do they care about transportation planning? Well, in the area of safety, the enforcement and police departments are critical. The medical people are critical. The hospitals, the, the responders, first responders are critical. So when you're talking about how do you organize yourselves and try to get the participation of those agencies and groups and people who are interested in safety in this case, you need to reach out beyond your normal people that show up at public hearings and say we need to have bigger roads or we need to have transit or we need to have more ped bike or whatever the case is. You really need to get these types of groups and individuals involved uh, in your process. Now, what I'm going to do um, is give you my observations based on too many years of experience. Um, as I said, I've you were all born after I started my professional career, which makes me depressed every now and then when I do this. When I was a professor at Georgia Tech, every year the incoming classes were 17, 18, 19 years old, yet I got a year older. So after 20 years, I got depressed because I was older, but the young ones were still the young ones. So, um, but my, based on my observation, based on that process, here's what I, and I'll do this throughout my entire talk. Here's some of the things that I've learned. I was director of transportation planning and development for Massachusetts for six years. So I have this experience of real world, how do you deal with a lot of people in the context of a, an actual agency, professor for many years and now consultant. Um, so my observations in this initial step in terms of organizing yourself is breadth is important. You need to get the entire perspective or range of perspectives with regard to safety in this case is involved in the process. Um, I find and I have found in my own experience that having permanent committees or permanent advisory boards including these perspectives is better than saying, well, we're going to form a task force. You know, I often told my students in my, uh, when I taught at MIT and when I taught at Georgia Tech, uh, when in doubt, do two things, form a task force and develop a matrix. If you'd form a task force and develop a matrix, you've got everything covered. 
people will be impressed when you show them the matrix. Um, well, a task force is, a, is a, not a permanent institutional body. You form it, you deal with it, and then it disappears. My experience, again, is more permanently in terms of having something like an advisory board or an advisory committee that stays throughout the process and continues when your process is done and you go back to the beginning again in transportation planning. Give them something to do. I have been part of many planning processes where you form a group and you meet every six months and you say, here's what we did, rubber stamp it. We go back six months later, here's what we did, rubber stamp it. I've chaired those types of advisory boards and committees. That is not a very use, a good use of their time and they don't appreciate it. Uh, I didn't appreciate it when I was asked to participate in many uh, groups around the country. Um, and so make sure that those groups actually have something substantive to do. And in fact, they can help you throughout this entire process that I'm talking about in terms of goals, objectives, performance measures. They can be helpful to help you collect data that you may need. So there are very important uh, roles and responsibilities that such a group uh, can really think about. Okay, understanding the problem. Next step. How do you put safety into this? now? I know it says 2001 up there, and you're going to think, oh my god, he's dated. Well, the reason why it's 2001 is I did this in 2001. Well, it still may be dated, but 2001, okay? And why did I do this, all right? I'll tell you why I did this. If you're familiar at all, every, I think, two years, a group called the Texas Transportation Institute, now something different, would come out with their cost of congestion report. You know, this is terrible, it's costing Atlanta umpteen billion dollars. Well, in 2001, it was two over two billion dollars worth of social costs, if you will, of congestion in Atlanta. Okay, two over two billion dollars. And what would happen? The governor would get involved, the mayor would get involved, the director of the MPO would say, well, we're working on it. All the business community would be in an uproar. You know, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving would get involved. And this is terrible congestion, it's, it's causing, uh, it's a quality of life issue. It's terrible, why aren't you doing something about it? It's terrible. And this would happen every two years as the professor at Georgia Tech, I'd get the call from, would you please care to comment on the latest report that shows Atlanta is now fourth worst city in the country in terms of congestion, what is this all about? I finally decided, well, what is the comparable number for safety? Okay, for Atlanta for 2001. Uh, and by that I mean the way you, I hate to say this, but all of you according to your government are worth a little bit over a million dollars because of your purchasing power or buying power for the rest of your life. <laughs> Hate to say that, okay? Uh, but if I looked at the number of fatalities in 2000, oh, I did. I looked at the number of fatalities in 2001. I looked at the number of property damage crashes in 2001. I applied the average governmental unit, if you will, in terms of how much a property damage. Any guess what it was? What were the cost? What was the cost of safety? The social cost of safety in 2001 in Atlanta compared to 2.2.02 billion? Less than, equal to, or greater than? Guess. Greater than. Greater than okay. I presented this at a meeting in Atlanta, and, they, and they, they all guessed lower because, of course, they're focused on congestion. Well, it turns out uh, that the comparable safety costs, if you make these assumptions, and I can argue, I could spend the rest of the lectures saying why some of those assumptions are bad, um, is over $3 billion in the same year. They didn't believe it. They could not believe it that the safety side of things were much, was almost one and a half times worse than congestion. Well, I when I gave that talk, there was someone in the audience from Kansas City. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take the same methodology. I'm going back to Kansas City, Missouri, which is not as big and congested as Atlanta. And so he, and he contacted me after he did this. So you know what? We did for 2002 in Kansas City, we, did, we found our congestion cost was 215 million social cost. And we found that our comparable safety cost was 1.3 billion. Well, the AAA got involved. They said, this is really incredible. And so they contracted with myself and someone else to do a study nationally. In every single city in the country, the social cost of crashes and property damage and fatalities was greater than the cost of congestion. And I said, where's the outrage? Where is the governor saying, this is, we can't do this? Where is the mayor saying, this is terrible? Where is the director of the MPO saying, well, we're working on it? There wasn't the comparable outrage as there was on the congestion. Maybe because every two years there was a point in time when something was reported versus the continual carnage on the road you know, over a continual basis. Maybe that explains it. But what I was trying to do was to understand the problem. This was getting, remember, that's this gray cloud. Understand the problem. Uh, and then there are other ways of looking at this. You know, um, this is from Eugene, Oregon, uh, you know, by age. Uh, and by rank in terms of what's the greatest cause of fatality or death in each of these groups. What's in red uh, are accidents or crashes. And so you can see from 1 to, four, one to 44 um, was the number one ranked cause of death for age from 1 to 44 um, uh, in, in, in Eugene, Oregon, which is a university town. So they're involved with it. So 
This is another way of looking at, well, what is the issue? Is it an important issue? What do we need to do about it? Which goes through the process, but here's one way of trying to examine what the issue is. Um, here's, these are very typical ways of doing it. This is from what's in orange, uh, what's in brown is 2004 to 2008. This is Cheyenne, Wyoming again. Uh, and what's in orange is 2009 to 2013. And so they're monitoring over time, are they getting better or are they getting worse? Which is part of understanding the problem. And what you see, at least in Cheyenne, except for alcohol, which I can understand in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, except for, oh shoot, this is being videoed. Um, forgot about that. Uh, except for alcohol, they were made improvements, significant improvements in Cheyenne in terms of reducing the number of fatal and incapacitating injury crashes over time, which is to their benefit. Okay, so they can say, look, we're making progress, still bad, but we're making progress. That's another way of understanding the problem. Um, another way of looking at it, this is from Houston, Houston Galveston Area Commission, Area Council. Uh, they said we have to understand who's really using the system and what's happening to them. And so what you see teenagers, elderly, and male drivers, male drivers being more aggressive, uh, which evidence does suggest. Um, and again, you know, what that means in terms of high risk populations. Uh, so 21% of the region is teenagers in Houston versus 16,000 to the U.S. 79% in Houston are male versus 60% U.S. And so they're trying to understand the markets or the audiences that are used in the transportation system. And these, again, are just examples. For example, here's during the day when the crashes occur. Not surprisingly, it's afternoon. Uh, here's the causes, uh, driving under the influence uh, and also intoxicated. Uh, crashes by county in the, in the Houston region and what happened over time. So different ways of using data to get a handle on what's going on in that particular region with regard to safety, i.e. Crashes, uh, crashes in particular. This one I thought was interesting. Um, this goes back to Eugene, Oregon. And they were saying, well, you know what? There are two issues that we really want to understand. Um, this is for bicycles. Uh, this is called functional classification. If you will, it's kind of a small road up to an interstate. A high functional classified road is one that's really, really designed good, well, or whatever the case is, although Eric may disagree with that because he has issues with design. But an interstate highway is, you know, is a high, good, limited access, really good, high speed, high capacity, all the way down to you know, a dirt road, which is not so good. Um, and so over here you see rural major collector, that's a lower level, and over here you have more arterials, which are a high level. And over here is that the, where's the location along those roads? And they wanted to know where are our bicycle crashes occurring? Where should we be focusing on as part of our transportation planning process? And what you see is as urban minor arterials at intersections, which is right there, which by the way is common in most parts of the country. Uh, they said that's where we got to focus. So going through this type of analysis allowed them to kind of get a handle on what was going on. Um, this is another example that you often find in understanding the problem. This again is from Houston, uh, DWI, driving one of the influence. Uh, zip codes, this is where the zip codes are the people. I'm still trying to figure out what this is. I went to Google Map and tried to figure out what, why was that the largest location of driving under the influence uh, in Houston. Um, and all I can see is that there's a really large park there. Uh, and so I don't know if people are drinking in the park, but they don't live there. I mean, the zip codes is where people live. So I'm not quite sure why that stands out. But again, it's a way of trying to understand spatially where people are coming from, if you will, as they are um, being arrested uh, for uh, uh, driving under the influence. Okay, so my observations with regard to the data analysis, understanding the problem is that uh, you know, you, I went through, preparing for this presentation, I went through a lot of plans. And I kept looking at maps, I kept looking at data, I'm going to say, well, so what? Uh, so my sense is, planners in particular just love to throw data together to make nice maps and plans, just to have them in the plan. But to me, it didn't say anything. It didn't lead me to saying, well, oh, that's what it really means. Like, for example, in Eugene, where it was the minor arterials at intersections, that tells me something. That's good stuff. That tells me that's where we should be focusing our energy. But everything else was, well, God only knows. Um, so if, if you will, I think there's a tendency to do a core dump on everything you can possibly do without asking yourself, yourself the question, does this really mean anything? Um, and so that's observation number one, make it real, which is the issue of my Atlanta experience in terms of congestion versus safety costs, make it real to them. Uh, and that's also to get to the spatial element of in Houston where that big red mark is. That needs to be, that's a real area that we have to focus on in terms of that. Um, and, and identifying the problem is just more than looking at data. Um, get asking people, getting people involved in the process, looking at other aspects, other data sources perhaps could be important. And in, in, increasingly important, you'll see this come back over and over again, that the problem, uh, if you will, or problems, plural, 
is not just in terms of how people drive cars. It's not just about the infrastructure. Uh, it's also in terms of how you respond to crashes in terms of the first half hour in regard to getting to people before they die, uh, all sorts of things. So the, the, the issue is in terms of understanding the problem is understanding the many different dimensions of the issue, not just simply someone crashed Oh, isn't that terrible? And where were those crashes? Well, the question is why did they crash? And what was it that contributed to those crashes that we really need to understand if we're trying to make some strategies? Okay, Th a third area, okay? How do you incorporate safety into your goals and performance measures? All right, well, there is something called the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. By federal law, every state must have an SHSP. It turns out that this tells you, for the state, what it is that you're trying to achieve in terms of your goals uh, for safety. So it's a, it's a safety only plan, it's not what I'm talking about, which is transportation and how do you incorporate safety into it, but it's a safety plan, but it gives you a sense of what it is that you're trying to achieve. So obviously there should be a, a coordination and linkage uh, between the two. Um, so for example, in Houston, the state of Texas has identified these areas, impaired driving, distracted driving, speeding, intersection analysis, pedestrian, older drivers, and roadway departures. That's when cars go flying off the road. Uh, and in Houston, they said, you know, of these areas, we're going to be focused on impaired and distracted driving, speeding, intersections, and bicycle pets. So they said, here's why we're doing what we're doing in terms of the goals that we're trying to achieve. So they linked it to a bigger state issue. Florida has a similar plan. Every state has a plan like this. Uh, and here's just an example of, you know, goals, for example, and what we mean by an objective and performance measure. Goal in safety, ensure high standards of safety for the system. Now, how can anybody disagree with that? These things are motherhood and apple pie, okay? We, we want clean air. No, I want to breathe dirty air. No, no one's going to disagree with, you know, whatever the case is. So those are goals. So you need to make them a little bit more specific, which is the objective. Well, how are we going to have high standards of safety on the system? Well, we're going to reduce the rate of motor vehicle crashes. Well, how are we going to do that? That then leads to the strategies and actions, okay? Now, how do you measure that? Well, we measure it over time by looking at the crashes per vehicle miles traveled or the crashes per capita per person. Uh, there are ways of measuring it, and that's called a performance measure. Okay? And so that's what we mean by goals, objectives, and performance measures. Uh, and then this is, again, for Houston. Uh, so for impaired driving, for example, it says, well, one of the things that we want to do is to ensure that all high-frequency crash areas have at least one local law enforcement agency utilizing a grant that they give to provide more enforcement and they're going to have one new local enforcement agency per year. That's their target, if you will. Um, so Houston's taking the next step to say, okay, here's what we're going to do, and here's how it links back to what we said we wanted to do at the very beginning with regard to goals. Um, Gainesville, Florida, just gives you another sense. Here's what their goal is. We want to have a safe transportation system. Okay, fine. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, they're going to look at existing and potential safety problems on adjacent to transportation corridors through an interagency planning prioritization process. They're going to do traffic calming. I don't know if you've talked about that in class, but do traffic calming in residential areas to keep traffic slower than what you would normally have. Um, they have other things, you know, a safe routes to school program for children uh, walking and uh, bicycling. Vulnerable road users, usually uh, older, elderly, and younger people. So again, they have very specific things they want to accomplish in the safety area as part of their transportation planning process. Now here's one I find interesting, because, and I'll come back to this at the end, because remember I said before, one of the issues at the end is you want to feed back into, well, how are we doing? Well, the federal government now says you have to have targets. Well, this is from Florida, okay? This is the target for Florida. Number of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles of travel, basically zero. That's their target. Now, you look at this saying, now, if I, were, if I were naive and didn't know what was going on, I'd look at this and go, my God, Florida is by far the best place in the entire world with regard to traffic safety because, look, they have 1.4, this is per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. This is 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.5. 1 oh, my God, there's zero. They had no crashes in Florida in the year 2018. Incredible. What did they do? What they did was they adopted what's called a toward zero desk target, and they said, our goal, our target is to have no one dying on the roads in Florida. What a great thing. Of course, that's not happening, okay? I mean, I mean, you have to be realistic about these things. That's not happening, but that's the target in Florida and other states as well. And so the target is now, in my opinion, something to strive for, but it's meaningless in terms of actually monitoring what's going on out there, okay? And so it's something to strive for, but to show something like this, is to me, I think, somewhat misleading in terms of saying, well, what's really going on? Now, having a target, I think, is, got, is good, 
but you have to be realistic about it. So you could have, for example, incremental targets to show how you're trying to get there, uh, rather than just simply have a precipice falling off the uh, graph at 2015. Uh, but you see this in many states that have adopted this towards zero death thing. Okay, so my observations uh, in this area of goals and objectives and performance measures is you need to be consistent with other planning efforts like the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. Goals are laudable, they're good things to have, but they're motherhood and apple pie. Targets are laudable. You can see when I was doing this together, I like the word laudable. They're laudable, they're good things to have, but you know, when you say, well, we're gonna get to zero, in five years, that's not realistic. Uh, it's, that's not, in my opinion, credible. Um, because you're, not, you're just not gonna be able to do that. Strive for it, have interim phasing goals or targets if you want, but it doesn't make any sense. Um, looking at goals that in fact could be mutually beneficial, so we wanna have a safety goal, but at the same time, we could be improving the condition of the road, for example. So not only do you have safety benefits, but you also have infrastructure asset management benefits. So what is it you can do jointly to have multiple benefits for doing particular projects and goals? Uh, and then here's an important one, which I think is very important, especially for your generation, is that as you're following these things over time, and as you're defining what it is you want to achieve, things are happening in your world that you have absolutely no control over whatsoever. So for example, I'm sure you've heard of it, connected autonomous vehicles. Now we're gonna be zipping around in cars and no one's driving them. Well, presumably, the assumption is that those cars are gonna be safe because they're under control. You could be going, I'm, you know, Eric is a car and I'm a car. I'm getting closer and closer, but we're never, sorry, don't want you to get too excited. We're not, we're, we're not, we're not gonna crash because everything's under control. So we could be very, very safe. And so a lot of people are saying the number one benefit of a, a, continue, a content, connect, excuse me, connected and autonomous vehicles is safety. There are other issues, but it's safety, all right? Well, what's gonna happen to safety planning if everything is now under control of a central whatever? Who worries about it, who cares? Every now and then you may hit a pedestrian, which has been an issue uh, with some of these technologies, but, but, but you know, safety basically would disappear as part of the planning program because it's now handled through technology. I don't agree with that. I'm just simply saying those things are happening in your environment. The other thing is climate change. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end where I'm gonna show you some pictures and talk a little bit about climate change, especially in Florida, you should be a bit worried about that. Okay, now we're into the guts. Data analysis and modeling, data, there's all the good stuff that engineers love to do. And the question is where do you put safety in that particular part of it, okay? Well, Gainesville, okay, said planners, which I guess most of you are, um, once you have the data, according to the Gainesville MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, once the planners have the data, they can do all sorts of fun things as part of the analysis process. They can identify high crash corridors. They can determine what types of crashes that actually occur. You can identify what types of road type facilities that you have. You can identify what are the contributing factors. Did the driver not yield to someone who was going in front of them? Uh, were they speeding? Uh, were they distracted? I mean, there are all sorts of interesting contributing factors that could be part of this. Uh, you can look at the crash, uh, the roadway characteristics, were there signage, was the pavement markings, was the pavement wet, whatever the case is, what were the key human factors, did they have seat belts on, did they have helmets if they were riding, riding a motorcycle, were they impaired in some way through alcohol or drug use, um, what were the risk inequities across jurisdictional boundaries in terms of you know, where people live and what the household income is and what may that impact that may have, and they can actually do roadway safety audits, which are basically, a, you go out with two or three people, you look at a particular segment of road and say, here's what we can do to improve that, that road from a safety perspective. So there's a lot of different analysis tools that you can use. Uh, and usually, most DOTs have a portal or a website of some sort that people can go in and click on something and up pops a tool or data analysis, and this is the Florida DOT portal, they call it the portal, um, for traffic safety in Florida. And they give you all sorts of entree into technical tools and benefit cost analyses and all sorts of good stuff to help planners figure out what it is that they want to do. So that's very common across the country. You start to see things like this. This is from Houston again. Where are the crash intersections? Uh, highest crash intersections in Houston. Um, where are the pedestrian crashes occurring? Uh, So-called heat map type of representation. Uh, the density, if you will, of, of pedestrian crashes. Uh, there are all sorts of different types of data analysis you can use and, and understand things like the rate, frequency, uh, property damage, et cetera. GIS, geographic information systems, have been, has been incredibly important in safety because it can spatially connect things to see where things occur, how bad they are, what it possibly could mean, why, the, why things were occurring in those locations. Very powerful tool. Um, you could do it by you know, things like elderly crashes and where they are with regard to the population. Uh, this is from Detroit, Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, where they have 
fatal uh, A, B, and C level uh, uh, crashes, and then uh, property damage only crashes located on this particular corridor, so you can identify where those things occur, and then ask yourself the question, what do we need to reduce those crashes at that location? And in the state of Michigan, you can actually be concerned, apparently, about deers. Uh, deer crashes, because I'm from Wisconsin originally, and you always have often driving out in the middle of nowhere at night during the winter in particular, a deer would run in front of you and you'd run into the deer. And by the way, the car would be totaled, but the deer would just get up and walk away. Um, and so, so in Michigan, they've actually gone through a process of each one of these little deer is where a crash occurred between a car and a deer, I think over a five year period. So you can see uh, that a deer in Michigan is a safety hazard, um, at least from their analysis. Uh, forget about that. Uh, this is an interesting approach because this, this in essence says, you know, we need to get a good handle on uh, what can we do or what is the level of magnitude of problem. And so what they've done, this is in Toledo, Ohio. And so this is at, at a particular intersection, which was happened to be ranked the number one intersection in Toledo where they wanted to make improvements because of crashes. Let's, let's look at fatal, fatal crashes. They said, you know what, comparable intersections in Toledo, similar to the one that we are looking at, actually has 0.9, on average, 0.9 crashes per year. That's what other intersections have, okay? Our intersection has 3.5 crashes per year. Therefore, if you subtract this from this, you get a potential reduction of 2.6 crashes average on average per year, is what they're saying. So there's a potential here, assuming that you're trying to get back everything down to the norm, although one would argue you'd want to dip, you'd do better than that, but they're basically, trying to get some sense of what can we really achieve by making improvements at this intersection in terms of crashes per year, and then I can multiply by an economic number, a monetary number, of what, what, a, what the cost of a crash is, and I can come up with a number, a dollar amount. So it's a very simplistic approach, but, and yet I think powerful for people who are making decisions of where to allocate money, who aren't transportation planners, who aren't transportation engineers, and they can look at that and say, oh my goodness, we can make a significant improvement here if we sp devote some money to this. That's really what this is intended to show. Okay. This is an interesting issue. Um, this is, uh, EJ is environmental justice. Um, and so it's primarily low income and minority population neighborhoods in Houston. Um, and I found this analysis intriguing, uh, but also somewhat uh, suspect. But um, So what they're basically saying is if you look at where the crashes occur in Houston, and they've identified what they call environmental justice zones, that's where people who are primarily minority and low income live versus those who are not. Uh, and high disadvantage are those that have uh, minority and low income and other things associated with those are called high disadvantage. And what they said was, you know, 61% of the crashes in Houston occur in these zones, 39% occur in that zone. Um, for crashes per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, 179, 169. Um, so what they were trying to do, they, they did this analysis because they were by their own rules required to do an, a, a, an equity analysis basically is what this is. But then they quickly said, but we're not making any judgment. We are not saying anything about people who live in EJ zones, about this is, quote, further research is necessary. And so they did the analysis to show what the results were, uh, and then took a step back and said, well, we really can't make any conclusions on this because we have to know, go dig deeper into this particular issue. But this also is very common, doing an analysis called equity analysis to say, are there disproportionate benefits or costs to different groups of populations in your region, in this particular case, relating to safety? Uh, well, forget them. Okay, so my observations, I, you know, I, I already said that some of these are, I'm gonna repeat again because they, they are relevant, obviously. Data analysis should tell you, say, well, why is that important, so what? Uh, it's, data analysis should not look just on infrastructure, but should get it in terms of behavior response. You saw that before. This is an interesting one. Transit, you know, I've been talking about roads primarily and some, to some extent ped bike, but what about transit? You don't often find transit safety in transportation plans except through the transit agency. Transit agency has their own transit safety, and that's the reason why a lot of transportation planning agencies stay away from it, while well, the transit people are doing it. But I would argue that one of the big issues in major transit systems is what's called the first mile, last mile. So for example, in Atlanta, if any of you have been to Atlanta, you know the rail system, MARTA, the rail system, is that, and I live in Midtown, so I have to walk to the station. That's part of that short distance that I have to get to. And if that was unsafe for whatever reason, I ain't gonna do it. Okay, what's happening on that road and the sidewalks getting to my, trans my rail system is under the jurisdiction of transportation planning in, the city, in that case, the City of Atlanta Department of Transportation. 
Um, and so that is part of the planning process. So the transit element is not necessarily how does the transit agency get, do their buses and their trains and stuff to make it safer, but is also very importantly, how do you get people to and from these areas safely? Classic example. Um, I was in Melbourne, Australia. Well, this is probably not a good example, but, I, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, I was in Melbourne, Australia doing a study on something or other, um, and I was riding their light rail, their tram system. And Melbourne has the largest tram system in the world. And so I'm sitting there looking at their platform, and they have a gigantic yellow painted circle on their platform. Uh, you know, being the professor that I was, I said, why? Why do you have a giant yellow circle? Um, you know, on your platform. They said, well, because their studies showed they were trying to encourage more people to use the tram system in Melbourne, and they saw that they were able to attract people up to a certain level, but they could never get above that level. And so they did surveys and all sorts of good things, and, they, and people said, safety, we don't feel safe. We don't feel safe riding the system. And thus, what they did is they painted giant yellow circles on the platforms for the light rail system, and they informed everybody that if, if you stand in that yellow circle, you are under surveillance by a camera at all times. And that, that therefore you should feel much safer. Ridership skyrocketed. Because now people felt that they were safe. Now, remember I said Melbourne was the largest tram system, so they must have a lot of stations, right? I said, well, how many cameras do you have in Melbourne? I said, five. I said, five? Uh, how many circles have you put? Oh, 200 and some. I, I, said, what it, what, I said, well, we just tell people if they stand in the yellow circle that, that, that under surveillance, and then we just move our cameras around you know, on a rotational basis. Um, so people have the perception uh, that they're safer. Now, I don't think that's necessarily good because you're misleading people, but the point is that safety was a huge issue in terms of people using the system, and once they felt safer, people were more willing to use that system. So that's an issue in terms of how you look at this first mile, last mile issue thing. thing. Um, and then I did this for Eric Dumbo, Professor Dumbo, which is, you know, well, where are we talking about how do you change your highway design uh, in your corridor or on your roads to make it a little bit safer and have cars go a little bit slower, whatever the case is. That's not usually part of the planning process. That's usually after the planning process, but I would argue that once you start thinking about these things that you should be at least having that conversation and discussion among the planning process. There's only one MPO, back in the day that did this, it was Albany, New York, which actually worked with the New York State DOT, trying to get them to rethink about how they were designing urban roads uh, so that, in fact, it wasn't for the preference of the cars as much as it was for making sure everybody uh, got, was safe in that particular corridor. And then the issue of 100 million vehicle miles travel versus number of fatalities, what does that mean? That means I got into a huge argument with the New Jersey uh, Commissioner of, of Transportation for the state of New Jersey. He was arguing that the most important thing was we need numbers that so how many people have died per 100 million vehicle miles traveled in the state of New Jersey? Which means you add up all the number of vehicles in New Jersey and number of miles that go, and that's what's 100 million vehicle miles, and that's called exposure. And, and, and engineers love this, you know, it's an exposure. If we have so many, 100 million people, and we only have two people dying per hundred, that's really great because look at how many people are out there traveling and we only have two, isn't that amazing? I argued with him that the issue was how many deaths do you have? And he said, what do you mean? I said, I want to know how many people are killed on the New Jersey highways every year. Well, you don't understand. I said, no, I understand. I said, I understand. I said, I said, and I understand the issue of exposure, that you've got all these people, a lot of people in New Jersey, a lot of these people riding in their system. But to me, one death is one too many. And how are you going to look at the, person, the family of the person who died on that road and say, well, look at this, though. It's only one per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. You should feel lucky. Ain't going to happen. So we had this big argument back and forth. So what they did is they modified their plan to, to show both, um, which is probably the right thing to do. But that's something that's just interesting. And then I said GIS is a powerful tool, which it is, um, and, and not only for us, but also for many of you outside of transportation. OK, get, getting close to the end. So we got evaluation. As I said, how are we going to determine priorities and all this? Um, and so there are a lot of tools out there, benefit cost analysis. These are, I won't go about the acronyms. Uh, Eric Dumbau knows these if you ever are interested in it. But there are a lot of interesting manuals and tools to say here's how you compare and do trade offs and all sorts of good things. Uh, this is the highway safety benefit cost analysis from the US Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration, which shows you how to do these types of things. Uh, some MPOs like Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, which is Detroit. Uh, actually has tools and analysis efforts that they use with their local governments to come do their evaluation process. So my observations are the following on this area. 
Monetary versus non-monetary. If you do benefit cost analysis, I don't know if you've done this any of this in your program, but if you do benefit cost analysis, you have to monetize. You have to everything is in dollar. As I said before, you you all according to your government, you're all worth about a million dollars. By the way, I'm not, because I'm older. So I don't have many more years left, although I keep telling my kids I'm going to live to be 250 just to get them scared. Uh, but you know, I'm not as, I, you are more valuable than I am, okay? Because you have many more years ahead of you to be able to contribute to the economy. And according to my favorite government, apparently I do not. Well, whatever. Um, but we monetize people's uh, bodies, okay? We monetize your time. The amount of time that you've been sitting here listening to this incredibly stimulating conversation, uh, I can put a monetary value on that uh, put up to put in my benefit cost analysis because some economist somewhere says a student who is forced to listen to somebody for 45 minutes in university, that's 20 cents per hour or whatever it is. And they can, by the way, it's not that, but it's a little bit more than that. But, but we can assign, but everything has to be monetized. But you know what? The world isn't everything about money. Um, and so there are other issues like psychological benefits. There are, are family quality of life issues that need to be thought about as you go through this. So that's an issue. I mentioned co-benefits um, in terms of how do you portray this in terms of not just safety, but try to reinforce, uh, get people excited about you can do safety, you can do infrastructure condition, you can do quality of life, all sorts of things why you should invest in this particular project. The biggie is this one. Um, I faced this in Massachusetts. I faced this in years when I was doing consulting. I faced this a lot in research. What does this mean? This means that if you have an investment program, for example, in the metropolitan area of Atlanta, and you're the MPO in Atlanta, and, you have a do and you're basing your decisions on an economic analysis, okay, and you have money that you can put into a freeway, which has a lot of crashes on it, and you're gonna, and you're gonna reduce those crashes with all those vehicles, and you have over here a bike path and maybe a sidewalk, um, that has not that many people walking on it uh, or not that many bikes on it, they're going to lose every single time. Why? Because in Atlanta, we have roads that have 350, 400,000 cars a day on them and you multiply that, you know, time, whatever value it is and, and I'm always going to put my money over here. Always, 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 always. To bad pet bike, not going to do it because you just don't come out in the analysis. What some MPOs have done in Atlanta as well is they've set aside money. They said, that's not fair. That's not fair to the pet bike people if we're always throwing money into roads because they're always, yeah, there's always a volume of cars that we're going to set aside some money. Here's the money we're going to do pet bike on. Now we have to determine within pet bike where we're going to allocate, fine. But we think it's only fair that some money be set aside for pet bikes. A lot of MPOs now do that. But when you, when you try to compare apples to apples, generically, uh, pet bike always loses uh, just because of the volume that's on the roads. That's a big issue. Value of time, value of life. And then I mentioned, I keep coming back to this, it's not just infrastructure, it's also behavior, operations, et cetera. Um, getting to the end. Okay, now we're talking about the long-range plan. How do you get projects in the long-range plan? Well, you need to prioritize, okay? But again, you have all these projects. Um, this is from Denver, Denver Regional Council of Government. They say, you know what? We now have different categories of safety, roadway operational improvements, and we're gonna assign points for every project proposal we have in front of us, you can get up to 16 points if, you're, if, it, if your congestion is really high on your road. Um, if it's emphasized in your, if you have an emphasis area or they've identified emphasis corridors in the Denver region, you get up to a certain number of points. If the number of points and weighted crash is up uh, compared to your state rate average, you get up to seven points, depending on where, if you're greater than the state rate average, you get more points because it's a worse situation. Um, and if the, the average weekday daily traffic per lane is greater than 11,000, um, you get a lot of points. In other words, you have a lot of cars there and you're making improvements to, you're gonna have those benefits to a lot of cars that gives you more points, okay? And they do this for different categories. Uh, roadway reconstruction, roadway operations. Here's a pet bike uh, projects in Denver. Uh, you get up to four points um, and this is how you define it. Four points if you're on the regional bicycle corridor path uh, plan for Denver. Um, if you're in the community bicycle corridors, you get up to two points, four points if you're on the pedestrian projects along major regional arterials. So in essence, they're assigning points uh, that go into the scoring for overall project decisions at the end uh, based on things like this, okay? Um, and this is, again, fairly typical, but again, set aside so you're not competing with uh, road projects which will overwhelm any of these types of projects that you may have. Uh, and then uh, uh, there's further information that they have with regard to how they score. Um, Etc. And then TIP evaluation, uh, transportation improvement program evaluation, etc. No big deal. Uh, this this comes from Gainesville, Florida. This shows you some of the examples that comes out of their safety planning process. Uh, intelligent transportation system coordinated traffic signals is a project. 
uh, different types of channelization, um, turn lanes, for example, interchange and improving the improvements, uh, traffic management systems in terms of signalization. So these are the types of projects that pop up uh, are their transportation planning process. Um, okay, so my observations here uh, are, do you have a separate safety plan or do you try to incorporate or integrate it into your long range plan, which covers many different things? Um, you have to have a long range plan. I don't, you can have a separate safety plan if you want to, but you have to have a long range transportation plan. And I would argue there should be a safety element of that plan. You can refer to your safety plan if you have one, but there needs to be something in your long range plan that deals with this. Uh, you need to be obviously consistent with regard to other plans that you have, such as the statewide highway safety uh, strategic plan. And then how do you sell this plan? How do you get people's attention to say, this is something that we want to do. This is what we want to allocate dollars uh, to improve safety on the transportation system. And then finally, how do we monitor this? Okay, well, it turns out your federal government requires uh, every state DOT and MPO in the country to monitor on a yearly basis these five performance measures. So, if you want to go to Butte, Montana, or Seattle, Washington, or Madison, Wisconsin, or wherever you want to go and say, I want to know how many fatalities there were last year. Well, you could go, certainly go to the database, it'd probably be the easiest thing to do, but you could also go to the MPO and say, well, what was your monitor? What was your measure last year? They will know because they have to collect this information. So number of fatalities, you know, here's your per 100 million vehicle miles thing, number of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles, and by the way, they actually have a measure for non-motorized, if you will, ped bike. Uh, so there are measures, there is a measure that relates to the non-automobile, although usually these involve an automobile, but, but this, you know, how many ped pedestrians or bicyclists were actually injured and or hopefully not killed, but uh, that is monitored on a yearly basis uh, as per federal rules and regulations. Um, your DOT, the Florida DOT, has what they call a dashboard um, where you can go in to this website and actually click on a particular measure that you're interested in. Uh, for example, total serious injuries in the state of Florida, um, and the dashboard basically means red, yellow, green, transportation concept. Uh, if it's red, that means we're not meeting our goal or we're not making our target. Green means, oh, we're doing really, really good. Uh, yellow means, mm, we don't know, we're still in the iffy area uh, and we need, maybe have to do something. So this is called a dashboard. Uh, a lot of, some state, not a lot, but some state DOTs have this. But Florida, again, has this and they use it to monitor progress in the state transportation system towards those particular goals. And then I come back to this again. You know, here again is Florida, where they've got a goal of, or target of zero, uh, which I, you know, I think it's laudable. There's my wonderful word again, laudable. That's the word of the day, laudable. Uh, but, you know, I, I just don't think it's realistic. Um, so I think you need to be, you know, I think you need to have something in between that uh, and where you are today. Okay, forget that. So, this is my, this is not my last slide, but it's my last slide on safety. Um, I assure you, as Eric knows, this slide would not satisfy any graphic arts requirements for any conference presentation in the country because it's too busy, it's too messy, there's too many things going on, but that's exactly why I use it, which basically is the message is, is that if that is what's in blue is the transportation system planning process, what's in yellow is where you can incorporate safety. It's really throughout the process. Um, then there's ways of dealing with it, and it's something that I think the transportation planners have to think about very carefully. Now, the last topic, which won't take long, is I, I've been, most of my work in the last 10 years has been on climate change and extreme weather. And I kind of, you know, I, I was thinking about this before I was present, uh, preparing this. I think, you know, there is a transportation safety element to that, clearly. Um, and so um, uh, there was a big national conference which I organized, uh, helped organize, but I really organized it last year, uh, last week, <laughs> last month in Denver on what's called transportation system resilience, which is how do you deal with systems that are disrupted uh, and, and bounce back and all sorts of good stuff. And what I did, I started eight months ago in preparation for that conference. Every day I'd go on the internet, you know, get on my uh, Google stuff, and I'd look at what the headlines were for that day. And I collected headlines for eight months on anything that had anything to do with disrupted transportation systems. And then what we did at that conference, whenever there was a session before people started to speak, there was just a continuous rotation of headlines in the news, in the news, in the news. It was phenomenal. I was shocked. I have over a thousand headlines in eight months that have something to do with disrupted transportation systems, usually because of weather. Okay? But here's some examples. These are actual headlines over the last six months or so um, that relate to disruptions to the transportation system and the consequences of those disruptions to society and or communities. Um, and clearly, 
transportation safety, how you uh, deal with these disruptions as they occur, how you anticipate those issues with regard to making the, the response safe, and then obviously how you recover from those things in a safe way are real issues. So there are examples all over the country. Uh, this is from California. We're currently doing um, studies in California for the California Department of Transportation on a variety of issues. This is wildfire. I would suggest to you that that's not a safe environment for driving on that road. Um, I suggest to you that this is not a safe environment in terms of smoke uh, because people can't see as they go through that smoke and if someone goes into that smoke and stops, uh, the person behind them doesn't know that that car has stopped and presumably can't see the, the red lights, you go smashing into that car. Um, and so that's a very unsafe situation. Uh, this is from Jacksonville, I believe. Um, I think. Uh, anyway, this is from one of the hurricanes, obviously real issues here. Uh, and this is from one of the coasts, I think, up in New England, uh, where basically the storm surge came in and washed away the road. Um, so I would suggest to you that there are transportation safety issues here and risks associated with that. This is ice again in Atlanta two years ago, or three years ago, if you remember. We had, God help us, we had an ice storm in Atlanta. And whenever something, and I'm sure it's the same here, if anything, if, if, even if a snowflake comes down, the place collapses. Um, well, this particular case, there was a real ice storm that hit Atlanta. And that is a truck uh, that completely uh, went across the road um, and blocked everything. Um, it was really, really bad. Literally tens of thousands of cars were abandoned um, in Atlanta. It turns out I was on a beach in Southern California when this happened. And I kept getting phone calls from my friends saying, oh, it's terrible, it's horrendous. Oh, God, that's really bad. I really feel bad for you. And people that I know and I love dearly said, Dad, what am I going to do? I said, well, don't get in, the, you know, get in the car next to you because you can't sit there. They're not, they didn't move for a day and a half. People were sleeping in the car. And there were people, there was snow. I mean, it was ice. It was cold. And there were people, you know, running out of gas. And I said, well, you should ask the person next to you if you can get in the car with him or her um, and see if you can use their heat. And then when they run out of gas, then go into your car so that you constantly have heat over the night. Well, she, my daughter was not going to get into a strange car, which I certainly have taught her that never do that. But if your life is going to be dead because you're frozen to death, I would say you need to think about it. Um, flooding. Uh, this is Hurricane Katrina, uh, and that's New Orleans. Um, and obviously, again, your transportation system collapses, uh, which not only has issues in terms of the immediate danger with regard to the transportation system, but if that's your transportation system, how are you going to respond? Uh, if people are isolated, besides boats, by the way, it, it, you know, how, what happens? I mean, you have to be able to get in there and help people that are now injured and or isolated in some way. And so that's a very important part of the recovery process, which again, I would consider as part of the safety environment. Uh, this is Vermont, um, uh, Superstorm Irene, when they went through Vermont a couple years ago, a lot of culverts and bridges got washed out. There were cities and towns isolated for weeks in Vermont, uh, which caused all sorts of issues. Um, um, so I would again, there would certainly be some transportation safety issues. This is New York City. Uh, this is uh, Sandy, Super Sandy. That is a subway station. Uh, in New York City, uh, where the flooding had reached the point where the, uh, the storm surge came in uh, and water, they shut the door to the subway station. As you can see, that helped a lot. Um, and the water was just rushing down the stairs and the, basically the subway was flooded. Um, luckily, they had evacuated it and they, t they stopped the subway the day before. Uh, but again, issues. This is again, Ice-mageddon, Ice -mageddon, whatever it's called in, in Atlanta. Uh, that's uh, 285, if any of you are familiar with uh, um, Atlanta. This is in Tennessee. Uh, where they had, uh, they had like three major storms coming together. It was the perfect storm uh, that was incredible in terms of the, the, and just washed bridges away and everything else and a lot of people lost their lives because of it. So again, it's, it's not just safety, but there certainly is a safety element to it. Uh, and I, I, that slide uh, over here is, is one that clearly says a lot too in terms of the types of equipment and things that we put in place for people to safely go from point A to point B, a traffic signal. Uh, in things like hurricanes and typhoons and stuff, they tend to disappear pretty quickly. Not even talking about the electrical grid. I'm just talking about the physical equipment. Uh, electrical grid is another issue completely. Um, so I would suggest to you, and this is my last slide, uh, I would suggest to you, and I'm completely biased because I've spent my last 10 years of my professional career looking at this, um, that you, in your career in particular, um, will, especially if you live in Florida, uh, we'll be dealing with these issues much more um, than that I have and Eric has in his career. Um, that this whole idea of resilience, um, of how do you plan, how do you design, how do you construct, how do you maintain, how do you operate a system 
that provides the most resilience for disruptions. Now, I'm not just talking about climate change and weather. I mean, there could also be cyber attacks. So I think a lot of people don't realize, I was doing a study on this recently, transportation is the third most vulnerable sector in the country against cyber attacks. Uh, why? Well, because we have a lot of command and control systems. Um, you know, a lot of people in the connected autonomous vehicle world are worried about um, you know cars being taken over by people who are doing cyber attacks. Uh, I, I don't. You probably don't remember this and probably weren't aware of it, but the Colorado DOT last year was attacked uh, by a cyber attack. Uh, their issue wasn't so much their command and control in terms of traffic management. But the, the Colorado DOT executive director spoke at this conference in Denver. He said the biggest issue he had, said he couldn't pay his people because the cyber attack had completely disrupted their entire human resource computer system. So they had no way of paying the Colorado DOT employees for like three or four weeks. He said, and for some people, that was a crisis. He said, so I spent most of my time, I being the director, spent most of my time trying to figure out how to get my people paid. Um, and so those types of attacks, I suspect, are going to be much more common than what they have been in my lifetime, uh, and certainly up until this point in time. So this idea, whether you're in transportation, whether you're in environmental systems, whether you're in community, community development, whether you're in buildings, um, whatever the case is, uh, you are going to be more and more concerned about and interested in how do you develop more resiliency in what it is that we as planners and engineers do. Uh, that's my prediction for your career. Um, and I believe, I think that is, yes, it says thank you. So let me end there, and I'd be glad to entertain any questions, comments, t uh, topics uh, on anything, even has nothing to do with transportation. So, yes, I could tell you were actually going to ask a question before you even did it. Uh, yes? So it's got to be frustrating for this because it's all um, based on human or human compliance. Like, you could put as many stop signs, yes. lights as you want, but it's still like you can't drive in. Yep. Early, drive Absolutely. Back. Yep. And I, I actually put, have put it more bluntly because I've had people who are not engineers or planners complain about the transportation system. I've, I've, I've been a little bit more blunter than you have or more blunt than you have. I said, you know what, we can build the best transportation system we can have. And I would argue that Atlanta has the best freeway system in the world <coughs> if no one uses it. Because uh, it's, it's beautifully, it's a be if you go on the freeway system in Atlanta at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's, oh my God, it's designed beautifully. And then as I put it, and I'm not saying this against anything in Atlanta or Georgia, but when you put stupid people driving that, things happen, okay? Um, and so you're absolutely right. It is often frustrating. And, and, and this issue of performance measures that we talked about before, you know, fatalities. And when the federal government came out and said, we are going to monitor, or the idea of zero deaths, okay? Zero deaths. A lot of state DOTs have said, we, do, we have no control over people. We can't tell people what they, well, we can, but we, you know, we can't control whether they drink. We can't control if they do drugs and get behind the driver's, you know, the driver's seat. How, 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 why are you blaming us if we can't get to zero deaths and we have no control over it whatsoever? And so there is that level of frustration, I would say, in that concept, and it, it's true. Now, having said that, you know, I, I've said several times it's, it's infrastructure, it's behavioral, it's operations. So I would argue with you that, in fact, DOTs shouldn't just focus on the infrastructure and operations side. They should be working with the safety people, with the educational system and other things to try and get them to, to figure out how can they deal with those issues. But I agree with you. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, I, I'm an engineer. I don't know how many are engineers in here, but I'm an engineer. I'm a registered professional engineer. I, I became an engineer because I wanted to build the Roman aqueducts. Uh, I wanted to build the cathedrals of medieval Europe. This is why I've never built anything in my life, uh, but I'm still an engineer. Um, and, you know, I deal with a lot uh, in terms of colleagues of mine who do build things, and they build these beautiful design things, and then something stupid happens of which they have no control whatsoever, and the whole thing falls apart because of it. So thank you for that observation. I think that's a great observation, and, and it really does show you how the field that you're in, planning, which I'm assuming most of you are in planning, no matter whether it's transportation or not, often a lot, a lot happens that <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it, but you try your best. Um, your dearly beloved professor here made a dissertation out of looking at 
roadside trees and other things about what you can do to uh, you know, slow cars down uh, with regard to that. And then some of the engineers came back and said, well, you can't do that because cars can break, you know, run into trees and people are... And so there's this whole issue of how do you deal with these things as much as you can as an, from an engineering point of view and a planning point of view. But I would argue uh, until we become a complete society on connected autonomous vehicles, we're not going to get to zero fatalities. You know, it's a wonderful target. I think it's great. But having driven up from Fort Lauderdale from the airport up here, you guys have some really crazy people on the road system. Okay, and I thought Atlanta was bad. You guys have out of control people here, uh, including I swear she was 106. Uh, <laughs> who I could not believe it. I mean, I got off a ramp and there was a two turn left turn lane ramp, and I was going to go. To, I had to go to Wells Fargo, look to you know where it is. And she's in the left lane and I'm in the right lane, so we're going like this, and she just cuts right in front of me, putting along, because I just, you know, she could hardly see above the thing, and she had gray hair, and I was putting on that horn, she goes, oh, really? You know, I'm just completely oblivious. Nothing against older women, I'm sure older men are the same way, nothing about old, I'm old too, but, oh, you know, I'm just going, the same thing, we had this beautiful two left turn lane design signals, and then you put a 106 year old woman behind the d d wheel, and the whole thing collapses, you know? Or man, not just a woman, but man. Okay, good, good comment. Other comments, observations? Yes? Um, what group do they suspect was behind the attack on Colorado DOT? They don't know uh, who it was uh, yet. Uh, the FBI is involved, and they're still trying to figure out where it came from. Uh, but they do not know. Uh, there have been other attacks against transportation companies. Uh, for example, Maersk, if you know Maersk is a big container ship, container shipping company. They were attacked also by, I, they believe, from some place unnamed in Asia, which I won't name it. Uh, but they were attacked and all sorts of things happened with regard to their terminal control systems and port handling, all sorts of good stuff. Um, so it's not, shall we say, it's not, uh, they do not believe the Colorado DOT was a homegrown terrorist thing. They do believe it came from overseas. And this is just, a lot of people, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not expert in this, uh, so whatever, but I read a lot and I talk to a lot of people who are in national security, is the way they put it, they believe this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, if, if you talk to the DOD people, Department of Defense, they're involved in this, you know, and again, I'm an engineer and I'm a transportation guy, so I, I always, always told my students, the basic foundation of society as we know it is transportation. Uh, without a transportation system, what are we going to do, right? Well, then my environmental colleagues came back and said, well, without a water system, we can't do anything. Then my planning people come back and say, oh, but without buildings, you know. So infrastructure is really, to a large extent, the foundation of how we operate as a society. And if you can disrupt the infrastructure through cyber attacks or whatever the case is, especially as we become, become more and more dependent on information technology to run that system, the more vulnerable you are, to people who can attack you if you can do it that way. So I, I, again, I think, I think that is going to be one of the key issues in the future in this country and other developed countries um, as we put more and more automation and, inf and, and, and information technology equipment stuff into our systems, more command and control, that's going to be a real issue. And in fact, I don't know if you read much about this, but when the North Koreans said that the, what they were going to do, and then there was the, the, the Russian, you know, when Obama was president, and there was a accusation of, you know, Russian interference in the 2016 election, apparently one of the things that was considered by the U.S. was to, quote, attack Russian um, infrastructure by cyber attack. Um, and that is, and that's, that's part of the arsenal now, is if you want to bring a nation, you know, to its knees quickly, is you attack their water systems, transportation system, electrical grid, you name it. Um, and if you can disrupt all of that, <laughs> you know, you've gone a long ways. Um, so I think every developed country who has any military capacity whatsoever has a capability to attack another nation through their cyber, cyber system. So it's something we as transportation people have to be worried about. And you as a future resident of this country, uh, long before I'm gone at 250 years old, uh, will be worrying about as well. Other questions, comments, observations, issues, concerns? I'm actually surprised you stayed this long. I mean, usually people trickle out. It was my, when, I would, when I would teach, they would just trickle out. By the way, you have to talk to your professor because I, I could never get this many students. After five o'clock, I always had to provide pizza um, for, for them to be here. So uh, you need to talk to... Oh, no, they're gonna be I, I was going to say, Professor Dumbo, I'm sure would be glad to <laughs> see what I'm doing. This is on video, so I've been a witness. You need pizza. No, no other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.